So on my right and to your left, we have His Holiness, Indra Dhyumna Swami Maharaj. Jai His Holiness, Indra Dhyumna Swami Maharaj. Jai. Jai. Thank you very much. And in the center, we have His Holiness, Giriraj Swami Maharaj. His Holiness, Giriraj Swami Maharaj. Jai. Jai. And uh, to my left and to your right uh, is His Holiness, Guru Prashad Swami Maharaj. His Holiness Guru Prashad Swami Maharaj Ki Jai. Uh, so to set the ball rolling, um, so to speak, um, one question that has, been from, has come from the audience is, how do we intensify uh, our chanting of the holy names? How do we intensify our japa, our kirtan, like that, our taste for the holy name and actually chanting our holy name chanting the holy names nicely uh, like that. So if we could have any of the three Maharajas start off, maybe uh, Giraj Maharaj, you might start off being the uh, one sitting in the center and then segue to anybody at all from the three. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Well, it's a, a pleasure to be here, sandwiched between these two <laughs> great souls. Um, I think just by, by being in the presence of uh, exalted devotees, our taste for chanting naturally increases. Um, we do facilitate japa retreats and well one point that just uh, occurred to me was a, a statement that Srila Prabhupada made on a number of occasions but specifically in the beginning of Krishna book, that we should always be aware of death. Uh, some of us have had experiences flying on airplanes where there's some turbulence or some difficulty with the aircraft and the plane suddenly drops. Uh, how intensely we would chant the holy name <laughs> under such circumstances. But the idea that we are not in danger at every moment is an illusion. We are in a precarious position. Uh, at every moment. Um, on one of my previous visits, recent visits to Houston, and it's, it, it's true anywhere, but you, you hear the sound of sirens. You see ambulances on the road. And I was thinking... You know, the, it could have been me. You know, it, it, it could have happened. It could happen to any one of us at any time. Uh, I mentioned it to His Holiness Indra Swami, and he replied, he thinks not you know, it could have been me, but when will it be me? Because eventually we all will face some calamity. We go to sleep at night and we tend to believe that the next day will be the same as 
the day before. But one day it won't be the same. So if we keep in mind how precarious our situation is in the material world, in the material body, Kamala Dala Jala Jivana Talamala, like a drop of water on a lotus leaf that could slide off the leaf at any moment and shatter. We will um, we'll chant and engage in all types of service to Krishna with more intensity and sincerity. Uh, and the one last note I would add on this point, uh, in the same vein, there's a young, uh, somewhat young devotee named Madhava. Uh, his his uh, parents are, are devotees in Mauritius. And he can sing the holy name for hours just close his eyes in a you know, slow, melodious way, just sing the holy name. So after one such kirtan, His Holiness Bhakti Bringa Govinda Swami Maharaj asked Madhava Prabhu, what, what are you thinking? You just close your eyes and you can sing for hours with su such feeling. Well, what are you thinking? And Madhava replied, I'm thinking that every mantra I chant could be my last. And I, I sing it with all the intensity I would, thinking this uh, could be the last. And one uh, final note I mentioned recently, but Kamal Krishna Goswami's brother, Karl Herzig, told me that whenever any of the family members leave the house, uh, the, the person will say to the others, I love you. And the others will say, I love you. Because when someone leaves the house, we don't know for sure if they'll come back. So they want the last memory. They want to be sure that the last memory is, is a pleasant one um, in which they express uh, their heart's deepest feelings for each other. So in, in the same way, when we chant the holy name, we're associating with Krishna. And we want, you know, our experience with Krishna to be uh, one of, of, of love, not, not anything else. So in that mood that I'm chanting the holy name, I'm associating with Krishna, and I don't know for sure that, you know, I'll be able to chant his name again. So, you know, in that mood, if I chant the holy name with full feeling, um, I, will, I will actually be in Krishna's association. Hare Krishna. <laughs> question was, um, how do we increase our attachment to the um, chanting of the holy names of the Lord? And there's many, of course, ways to answer this question, but Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, who was a great devotee of Lord Chaitanya 500 years ago, he composed a beautiful verse Samsara sarpa dushtanam murchitanam kolo yuge 
Asadham Bhagavan Nama, Srimad Vaishnava Shevanam. That in the age of Kali, those who have been bitten by the repetition of birth and death, samsara, shall get relief by the medicinal herb of Asadham Bhagavan Nama, or chanting the holy names of Bhagavan, specifically the Hare Krishna mantra for this age, and Srimad Vaishnava Shevanam, serving the lotus feet of the Vaishnavas. The chanting of Hare Krishna is always beneficial no matter how one chants it, even if one is mimicking the devotees or making fun of the Vaishnavas. So when we make a comment, oh, those Hare Krishnas or Hare Krishna. Still, the uh, sound incarnation of the Lord is so merciful that a person will get some benefit from that, for sure. Um, what to speak of a devotee chants uh, attentively and sincerely, but the potency of the holy name is magnified unlimitedly when it's chanted in the association of the devotees. That's the idea. Because that is a specific type of chanting that Lord Chaitanya, who is the incarnation for this age, who delivers the Dharma, Dharmantu Sakshat Bhagavat Pranitam, but for the Lord, no one else can introduce a system of religion in this age or any age. So Mahaprabhu specifically introduced uh, Samkirtan, or congregational chanting of the holy names. Krishna Varnam Tusha Krishnam Shangopanga Shiparshadam Yagnai Senkitan Prayar Ijantihi Shumedashaha. That Shumedashaha, those who have some intelligence left in Kali Yuga, after all the sinful activities that are going on in the bad association, if they have some intelligence left, they will recognize that the same Lord who appeared in Dupura Yuga, bluish-black like a monsoon cloud, Shwayam Bhagavan, the original form of God, has again appeared in the age of Kali in a golden form. And he can be recognized by the fact that he's singing and dancing, surrounded by his associates, singing his own sweet, the holy name. Previous to the appearance of Lord Chaitanya, the Vaishnavas were mainly retiring to the vana, to the forest, like Vrindavana, Vrindavan, and there in the solitude and peacefulness of that atmosphere, they were chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Oh, that's Bhajananandi. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he came, he encouraged them to come out of the forest and to assemble together and go th on the public avenues and chant very loudly, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Nama, Hare Nama. And by following that command, that supreme command, divine command of the Lord, the chanter and anyone who hears the chanting they're equally benefited. So it becomes more potent when following this particular instruction of, of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, we experienced this yesterday. Um, I've just come from um, Salt Lake City, where my godbrother and god sister, uh, Charu Das and Mother uh, Vaibhavi, uh, built a very beautiful uh, temple. They uh, built it in the style that we see at Kusham Shorovra in Vrindavan. We do Govardhan Parikaman. It's a beautiful temple, the beautiful lake. So they styled the temple after that architecture, and they get 50,000 visitors a year, and it's quite remarkable because that's Mormon territory. If you were thinking to open a temple, you might not necessarily think to go to a place that 95% of the people are very dedicated to their religion. But having faith in the holy names and having faith in Srila Prabhupada, this couple went there, and the Mormon people are very pious. They actually follow three of the regulative principles that we follow. They don't take any intoxication, there's no illicit sex, and there's no gambling. And even meat-eating, uh, to a certain degree, is discouraged uh, in the Book of Mormon. So the people are very pious and they're very interested in Krishna consciousness. So a lot of them are coming. So as a result, the devotees are invited to different Mormon functions. 
I found that very remarkable. And yesterday they had um, organized a um, assembly to uh, bring awareness to, to the problem of hunger in the world. And there were 1,200 students, 1,200, you know, young Mormon boys and girls who came there and eager to hear from their elders and their authorities how we're going to solve, you know, this problem of world hunger. And after a couple of speeches, we were asked to come on and entertain the youth. They gave us 20 minutes. So it was just like this. <clears throat> Everyone was sitting down, mostly, because the way they did it is they said 10% of the world eats very nicely, so they had tables arranged with a big buffet for 10% of the students. 20% of the world's population, they eat fairly okay. So 20% of the students were sitting on the ground with some fairly good food. But 70% of the world population doesn't eat very well. They're impoverished and they don't have enough nutrition. So 70% of the students were sitting on the ground and they had rice and beans. Just to kind of demonstrate and understand, be sensitive to the situation, how they could raise charity, that was the idea. So the speeches were going on and everyone was sitting down and we sat down and we had an old rickety harmonium. Many of the keys weren't working. <clears throat> we had a pair of cartels and Mother Vaibhavi, who just started taking Murdunga lessons, I think she was on her fifth lesson, <laughs> she played Murdunga. And here we were with, in front of 1,200 kids. We had a good sound system, that was the thing. So we started Kirtan. And there was maybe nine or ten of us sitting on the ground, and you know, I started singing like we were like Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. I could just see the eyes of the kids light up. And the association of those persons who have dedicated themselves to chanting the holy names and are <clears throat> living a lifestyle, a pure lifestyle, which is conducive to getting the full benefit of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, like we do in our temples and our homes. We live a lifestyle which is conducive to get the full benefit of the holy names. All of a sudden, spontaneously, two or three students just jumped up and started chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, and it was infectious. Within 15 seconds, 1,200, and I'm not exaggerating, there was not a person left sitting, or stand. everyone stood up and started dancing. So for 20 minutes, we had this wild... And it wasn't they were just testing the mantra. They were chanting from the heart. They were raising their hands and they closing their eyes. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Like that. And then the dancing started. That became transcendental pandemonium. <laughs> Finally, the elders, the men and the beers in the back, they had to cool it down, cool it down. <laughs> We have some more lectures. But afterwards, they came up and they said, we'll probably get in trouble for this, but that was the best show of the night. <laughs> so like this, what is, it's infectious. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur has stated like that, that Krishna consciousness is infectious in a good sense. Just like, how do you catch a cold? Now it's, it's coming on to spring, so people get colds in the spring because they start, you know, it's getting warm, so you take off your sweaters and your jackets, and you're not... But then the cold breeze comes in. You get sick. You get a cold. Achoo! And the person sitting next to you, or three or four, or five, three or four or five days later, they also achoo! They get a cold. <laughs> so, Krishna consciousness is like that. Prabhupada says in the Krishna book that when a pure devotee like His Holiness Giridharj Swami speaks, the nectar goes into the air like little droplets, little droplets of nectar. And then they fall down on the heads of the audience and everyone becomes Krishna conscious. <laughs> so it's, it's infectious. The association of devotees is, is infectious. And even, you know, even if you don't want to catch a disease, you catch it because it's infectious. So even though you may not want to be Krishna conscious, when you come into the association of devotees who have a taste for the holy name, the holy name acts. The seeds are planted, and it's only a question of time. One time Prabhupada said that uh, when anyone, irregardless, chants Krishna's holy name, in fact, Prabhupada told this to his, his uh, holiness, Tamal Krishna Goswami, the Lord notes that person's name down in his little black book, Prabhupada said, 
And he follows that person birth after birth until he makes him into a devotee. So, so therefore we should, we should take this holy name far and wide on the, on the order of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and it will create a spiritual revolution in, in our modern society. And by doing that, by making that effort to share our good fortune with others, as Jesus said, because I've just come from Jesus' country, Utah, it's better to give than it is to receive. It's not easy to give the holy names to those who are not interested, but on the order of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Sridhar Prabhupada, if we do, the blessing is that our taste of the holy name increases. This is the transcendental secret. We can try so many things, getting up earlier, and that's all well and good. But our progress in Krishna consciousness is more or less based on blessings. Because in Kali Yuga, we're very inept, inept in making progress, controlling our mind, our senses. You know, it's almost hopeless for the souls of Kali Yuga. But if we serve a pure devotee and his mission, the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the reward, so to speak, is that we develop a genuine attachment for the holy names. Therefore, Bhaktivinoda Thakur concluded, he was speaking to his guru. I'm simply running behind you, shouting, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. So the best way to develop an attachment is to chant together in the temple and on the streets and be blessed with some taste for the holy names of Krishna. Hare Krishna. certainly hard to follow up after two such enlightened speakers enunciate so beautifully on the holy name. But I was just thinking that if one can come to the point of understanding the seriousness of human life, as His Holiness Giri Raj Maharaj uh, helped us understand, and then the most important factor of associating with Vaishnavas. Uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said there are five essential activities which will um, boost our Krishna consciousness. And that is Sadhu Sangha Nam Kirtan Bhagavata Shravana, Mathura Vasa, and Murtina Shraddhaya Sevana that we should associate with the devotees, chant the holy name, hear the Srimad Bhagavatam, live in a holy place, and uh, worship the deity in Tulsi Devi with faith. So once we try to take a little more seriously this boon of human life, and we take advantage of this key activity, for developing a taste in the holy name, associating with Vaishnavas. Um, it's stated in the Puranas, Binatam Namanamino, that there's no difference between Krishna and his holy name. So understanding that, understanding that when I have this opportunity, by the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the Vaishnavas, to associate with the holy name, I should take advantage of it. I should be very, very serious about this because it's Krishna. Just like Krishna, well, Krishna may be a little too much, but uh, let's say um, President Obama walks in right now, everybody would you know, stand up and be very enthusiastic, want to meet him for whatever purpose. And what to speak of Krishna? If Krishna walks into our heart, Krishna walks into our mind, Krishna walks into our life, in the form of the holy name, and we don't take it seriously, then uh, we're very unfortunate. So one key factor to developing attraction is understanding this is Krishna. And not only understanding this is Krishna, but what does Krishna mean, the most attractive? So the more we hear about Krishna, the more we take advantage of these opportunities to come together, satsanga, whether it be with a few devotees, even with a few family members, and we hear about Krishna. 
we take the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is recommended by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and we hear about Krishna, the Krishna book given by Srila Prabhupada, which Maharaj mentioned, a very beautiful summary of Krishna's pastimes, um, which Srila Prabhupada stated in such a way that it just flows. Sometimes when you read Krishna's pastimes in the Bhagavatam, the verses, uh, you have to have a certain amount of taste, but Srila Prabhupada's contribution of the Krishna book, this develops an attraction, an attachment. The more we hear about Krishna, the more we want to glorify Krishna. So this process of glorification also increases the holy name. But of course, if we don't take it seriously, then that attachment won't be there. So um, in the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's mentioned that uh, Srinvatam Shodaya Nityam that in every possible opportunity, we should try to hear with faith about the activities of the Supreme Personality of God. And Grinatas Cha Swatishtata. And we should take it very seriously. Not just, it's not just some passing lecture. I don't know. Maybe some of you have had the experience I have that if you're distracted, if you're thinking about something else, if that attraction for Krishna is not mature, then we can be reading some transcendental literature. And after a few pages, think, well, what did I just read? I've certainly had that experience. Maybe all of you are probably much more advanced than me. But um, anyway, this, this is also an essential factor that once we take advantage of association with Vaishnavas, then to make that solidify, you know, to make it really become uh, something that is crystallized within our consciousness, uh, the, the chanting of the holy name, we have to hear about Krishna. And that will make us want to chant more and more and more. Also, uh, we were just reading the other day, uh, yesterday, from Srimad Bhagavatam, about how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, on the pretext of embracing someone, would actually try to transfer the mercy of the Holy Name. He would try to give them that mercy. So as Maharaj said, uh, taking advantage of the, the fact that the devotees are trying to give us blessings, opening ourselves up, looking for that association through hearing, through chanting, through association, and matura vasa, making our home also a very uh, auspicious and uh, uh, a very conducive place for chanting Hare Krishna. So, I remember one time I... I visited a family in, uh, in Mexico. And so they, you know, they had, we had a little kirtan. We talked about chanting and about Krishna consciousness. And then they said, we actually, actually, we have some deities. We wanted to put the deities. So where should we put the deities? So I went over to the television set. I said, you can just put a cloth right over this, and then you can put them right up here. Since you're used to looking here anyway, so you can just put the deities there and that, you know, then your attraction for Krishna will increase more and more. So that's the little factor I wanted to add to this wonderful exposition by the two Maharajas. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, just one real quick comment. This is really amazing to see the three of you all together like this. It's really far out. Thank you all very much for doing this. <clears throat> I just wanted to ask you, is there any moment or special thing that you ever felt that you were Krishna conscious? And if so, what did you feel? <laughs> 
I think Giriraj Swami and Guru Prashad Maharaj are always like that, not just, it's not just one moment. <laughs> <laughs> you have to you have to direct us. Hmm? It says you, you, you answer first this question. You can just rephrase that. <laughs> when was the moment we felt most Krishna conscious? Like that, that that's probably more appropriate. Okay. Thank you much. Um, right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, just then. <laughs> I get it. Every time it, we're in a situation like this. <laughs> well, I'll start over because I know you wanted more than that. So. <laughs> Um, well, again, I think our Krishna consciousness is always increased in the association of devotees, the more the merrier, and um, particularly in the association of advanced devotees. Um, we should seek out the association of devotees because they're very merciful, and whatever um, progress they've made, they will very happily share with, with others. Um, I remember one time in Paris, of course, for the disciple, the most advanced devotee is his spiritual master. Um, and by always remembering the lotus feet of the spiritual master, we're, we are Krishna conscious. Um, one time Prabhupada came to, um, to Paris, and um, there was, we, our temple president had us do a marathon so that we could renovate the temple and make a new set of clothes for the deities and get all new kitchen paraphernalia. Just everything would be new and fresh for Prabhupada's arrival. And <clears throat> he said the winner of the two, uh, those who come in first and second place, they'll have the um, privilege to bathe Sridhar Prabhupada's lotus feet. So I was a young devotee, and I thought, well, this is a very ex exceptional opportunity because I'd heard that there are three ways that you could make very rapid advancement in Krishna consciousness, as stated in Shastra. If you get the dust of the lotus feet of a pure devotee, if you can take the water that has washed his lotus feet, and if you can have the remnants of his prasadam. So myself and one of my friends, Bhagavad Prabhu, we worked very hard for three months. We would go into the metro system in, in Paris, we would go, we get up early, chant our rounds, and then we'd go into the metro before the sun came up. And then we would come out after sunset. So practically for three months we didn't see the sun, but we didn't mind because we were winning the marathon. And uh, we actually won the marathon, and uh, we were given the sacred um, task of washing Shudra Prabhupada's feet when he came. And uh, we did a little more sankirtan, and we bought a big silver bowl, and we bought a vase for pouring the water. And that wonderful day came that Prabhupada came to the temple, and then he took darshan of Radha Parasishwara. And um, then he sat down, he started playing the kartals. He was singing Jaya Radha Madhava. And about after a minute or so, Tears of ecstasy started flowing from Prabhupada's eyes, and the kirtan stopped, and he started shaking. So I was sitting at his lotus feet and watching this and thinking that I'm in the association of a pure devotee of the Lord who's feeling ecstatic symptoms of love of God. It was like being in the spiritual world. At that moment, I felt very blessed and Krishna conscious. And then afterwards, um, 
we were given that privilege of washing Prabhupada's feet. So Bhagavad Prabhu poured the water and I held the, the, um, the silver bowl there and we were washing Prabhupada's feet. And then afterwards it got full and we stopped, but the kirtan kept going. So we had a plan and um, beg, borrow, or steal, but get the mercy of the holy name, it stated. So we, in the middle of the kirtan, we ran upstairs and we uh, made a copy of the key to the president's office. And we ran in there and uh, opened and ran inside with this charnamrit and all the brahmacharis ran after us. <laughs> so we closed the door and all the Brahma and locked and all the brahmacharis ran into the door. <laughs> And we'd also bought some nice stainless steel cups, so we had this big, I mean, it was humanly impossible to drink that much water, but we did. <laughs> we sat there and we, we took the first dip and then we went some transcendental cheers. And we very slowly, knowing that the sanctity of that water and how it would make us Krishna conscious, we drank that water to our full satisfaction. And there were two drops left at the bottom, and we split those drops, and we took them each, and that's when I was the most Krishna conscious. <laughs> and then we, uh, we opened the door, and all the brahmacharis piled in, and they said, where's the nectar, where's the nectar? And I looked to Bhagarbha, I said, what are they talking about? He just tapped his tummy, ah. So because of that mercy, I think that's the only reason I'm still here. Shira Prabhupada Ki. One incident that comes to mind is uh, during the first time that Srila um, Prabhupada came to Boston, and it was the first time that I began to associate with him and the other devotees. And uh, Srila Prabhupada did a, a, a program at, at a university. And at the end of the talk, there was kirtan. And uh, in front of the seats were the students and uh, professors sat, uh, the devotees danced in a circle. And somehow as I was dancing in the circle, feelings of love for the people in the room just awakened in my heart. I'd never experienced anything like that. I was just looking at them and chanting and dancing. And then the, the, the feeling expanded it was as if it was flowing out of the room onto the territory beyond uh, in, in, in Boston. And then it was as if it was just flowing across the United States and then throughout the universe. And I had really uh, never had such an experience before, and I, I just felt so uh, at peace uh, uh, in that mood of love. And after the kirtan, I went up to Srila Prabhupada. I had never approached him uh, personally, but I was just so overcome, I, I couldn't control myself. So I just went up to him. And he was sitting on a dais. He was, although I was standing, but he was, he was on the same level, a little higher. And I said, that was wonderful. And when he heard those words, he began to chuckle. Um, and I knew it was a type of ecstasy. I mean, I, I just knew it was a type of ecstasy and his chest was heaving, and he was chuckling, and he looked at me with so much love and compassion and happiness, and said, 
Thank you very much. Uh, and I think that was a very memorable moment. It, it, it was all by Prabhupada's mercy that I had that experience, chanting the holy name in his presence. And um, it, it is those moments that uh, sustain us in Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I was trying to remember something, but I just realized that I've never been Krishna conscious. <laughs> but uh, also something, and of course I didn't have uh, as much great fortune to have so much personal association with Srila Prabhupada. But I, because I was a fairly good typist, 1976, I was allowed to stay right outside his room in Mayapur and type all kinds of little notes and letters. And one of the things I had to type was the sannyas mantra for the devotees that were taking sannyas. So I typed those mantras. And as I typed them, I, you know, I actually memorized the sannyas mantra, which I probably wasn't supposed to do. <laughs> but I was thinking... <laughs> I was thinking that... Um, Wow, I really, really would like to take sannyas. <laughs> and I was thinking at that moment that this is, this is a very special mercy. You know? And uh, so just shortly after I finished those, turned them in. And uh, so afterwards I got my opportunity, first opportunity, to go into Srila Prabhupada's room. So I sat there and I was so overcome, overwhelmed with just being there. I couldn't say anything. So then Prabhupada said, so what is your service? I said, Sankirtan, Srila Prabhupada. He said, you like Sankirtan? I said, yes. He said, so you should always do Sankirtan. And so at that time, I, th I just meditated, and I thought, this is, this is, this is my life and soul. This is my instruction. This is what I have to do. And I think that particular moment was the, the most blissful moment. And it's been the, my constant meditation trying to think, how can I fulfill this instruction, this indication from Srila Prabhupada ever since? You know, haven't always been so successful, but I keep trying. By your mercy, I can do so. Hare Krishna. Hare So there, there's a devotee that's uh, watching on the internet. He wasn't able to come because he didn't have a vehicle. And usually he asks pretty interesting questions, but he, have a, he has a very simple question. His question is that he says that people are separated by their religions. So why follow re a religion when it just separates people? This is from Bhakta Phil. Certainly, if religion separates people, that is not religion. No. That, um, of course, Bhakti, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains that there's only one religion, no, which is Jaiva Dharma, or the, the actual activity of the soul, which is to worship Krishna. And to wh whatever degree we don't perform that activity perfectly by being surrendered to Krishna. Because when one is surrendered to Krishna, who is the objective, the supreme objective for everyone and everything, the central uh, point of every activity, just like Srila Prabhupada gave the example, if you throw a stone in the water and it makes ripples in a, a lake or whatever, some body of water, and you throw another stone in the same place, and another stone in the same place, then all the waves will reinforce one another. So they'll, be, they'll be in perfect harmony. 
So if people understand how to serve Krishna, how to love Krishna, how to surrender to Krishna, then there's no question of, of ca- having, uh, causing any problem. But if the objective is not Krishna, if in the name of religion we want to serve our senses, we want to serve some political purpose, some social purpose, some individual purpose, then the stone, like stones landing in so many different places, the waves will clash and create uh, no, just a total disharmony. So real religion means that, that everything is directed to Krishna. And if that's, that's why we should follow real religion. As Maharaj stated, Dharmani Sakshad Bhagavat Pranitam. Real religion comes from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, not from people's interpretations of how to worship God, uh, how to use God in my service. And that's what really creates the, the problems. Religion it reaches into the deepest, uh, the depths of our, our heart, our soul, our consciousness. So if people utilize religion for some selfish purpose, then they can motivate people to become more hateful than any other motivation. But if they use it properly, then they can inspire everyone to love Krishna, to love God, to love one another. And of course, if we love Krishna, and we understand that everyone is part and parcel of Krishna, then we must love everyone. So the, the, real, the key is that we have to have real religion. my humble contribution. Once uh, one lady asked Srila Prabhupada, is there anyone comparable to Joan of Arc in Srimad Bhagavatam? Joan of Arc was a famous uh, Christian saint. And Srila Prabhupada said, why not Joan of Arc of Srimad Bhagavatam. What is Srimad Bhagavatam? Srimad Bhagavatam is, uh, comes from the word Bhagavan and then Bhagavat. Uh, any, anyone in relation to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Bhagavan, is Bhagavat. And Srimad Bhagavatam is the story of Bhagavan and the Bhagavats. So if Joan of Arc is a genuine devotee of the Lord, then that is also Srimad Bhagavatam. So someone who's genuinely God conscious appreciates God wherever he is in whatever tradition and appreciates devotees wherever they are, and whatever tradition. And in in that spirit, there can be genuine appreciation and uh, cooperation. Uh, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that we can appreciate any religion uh, that is pure. That means without uh, desires for sense gratification or mental speculation. So wherever we see that purity, we appreciate it and accept it. And even within our own tradition, Hindu tradition or Christian tradition or whatever tradition, if there's the contamination of the desires for sense gratification or mental speculation leading to impersonal monism, we reject it. So the real question is, is, is the purity, not the tradition. And, uh, you know, we have been blessed with a, a very pure philosophy 
and a very pure process. Uh, but we ourselves may not be completely pure, although we are on the path of purification and perfection. Um, but we shouldn't think that because we have this knowledge, we're blessed to have this knowledge, that we are automatically better than others who may not have so much knowledge. In their own ways, uh, they may be better than we are. And a humble devotee will see the good in others and see how he can learn from others. Uh, so if you approach people in that humble mood of, of appreciating their God consciousness and how we can learn from them, uh, we will progress nicely. And most likely they will um, come to appreciate us and want to learn something for us. And it will be a very uh, reciprocal relationship um, that leads to increased devotion and service to God for everyone. Hare Krishna. Well, I can't speak for other religions, but I can speak for our religion of Shanatan Dharma. Um, in the um, Ten Offenses to the Holy Name, one of the offenses is to blaspheme Vedic literature or literature in pursuance of the Vedic version. To blaspheme Vedic literature, which means our body of Vedas, and literature in pursuance of the Vedic version, which means any philosophy which or religion which teaches ultimately that God is a person. We would consider them to be Vaishnavas of various gradations, and we would respect them. And in that regard, Srila Prabhupada, the famous quote one time, he said that Jesus Christ is our spiritual master because he was preaching God consciousness, perhaps not to the degree that um, our spiritual master, Sri Prabhupada, did in our disciplic succession. But it's also according to time, place, and circumstance when a great, when the Lord or his representative or a great devotee comes from the spiritual world, they will reveal as much of the, as the people of that time can understand. Just like Jesus said, I have more to tell you, but you're not ready to bear it what little he did give them, they could hardly appreciate, and he was crucified. So we know that he knew more because he, say, he says he said that he sits at the right hand of the Father. But according to time, place, and circumstance, he wasn't able to reveal that message. But we would, we would accept him as a great uh, spiritual teacher and those who genuinely follow him as, as devotees of the, of the Lord. And in my travels, I always try to see the good in other spiritual traditions and people who are professing that and deal with them in that way. And when I do, I most often find that they appreciate us as well. In fact, um, after that wonderful engagement that we had last night, the news of that kirtan spread far and wide throughout the university and the city of Salt Lake City, et cetera, et cetera. And on the flight from Salt Lake City to, um, where am I? Dallas. <laughs> I'm moving so fast sometimes I don't know where I am. But I would think by Krishna's arrangement, I sat down next to a, a gentleman. It was one of those smaller planes where there's only two, two seats on one side and one seat on the other. And I was thinking, oh, I wish I had the one seat aisle because I wouldn't have to sit next to somebody and, you know, whatever. But it turned out that um, I was listening to my iPod and the batteries ran out. And the gentleman sitting next to me had a big book in the little pocket in the back of the, in the front seat there, in front of his seat. And it looked like a Bible. 
So I thought, well, <laughs> I don't have any books with me. My, my iPods went out of batteries, so I can benefit from reading something in the Bible. So I asked them, I said, sir, is that, could I read your holy scripture, that the Bible? He said, no, this is the Book of Mormon. I said, okay, I'll read the Book of Mormon. <laughs> and he said, you will? <laughs> I said, yes. I said, sir, God is one. He said, you Hindus think that God is one? You worship many gods. I said, no, you may, you're misinformed. Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchidananda Vigraha Nadir Adir Govinda Sarvakara. I said Krishna is just one of the many names of God. And I gave the analogy of the sun. There's one sun, and in different languages, they address the sun by different names. And as I was going on, all his apprehension, his doubts about us just vanished and disappeared. He said, This is wonderful. I did not know that you Hare Krishnas were personalists, that you believed in a personal God. I said, Yes, I, I do. We do. And I said, therefore, I wanted to read this book because we believe in the same God. And I she said, okay, read. <laughs> so I started reading. He's watching me. He said, if you have any questions, you can ask me. I will. <laughs> said, okay. So I said, what about the holy name of God? And he went through about 10 verses. You know, he showed me. I said, see, what do you think about that? I said, yes, we there's no difference between the name, fame, form, paraphernalia, pastimes. I said, in, your, in the Bible, it says, um, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, you know that verse? I said, yes, I read. Anyway, to make a long story short, he asked me who I was, and I said, I'm a monk who travels around the, the world, you know, preaching God consciousness chanting the holy names, and I said, who are you? He said, oh, I'm the dean of Brigham Young University. <laughs> and I said, oh, it's really nice to meet you, sir. He said, I heard about your program last night. <laughs> so I was, and we went on to have a two, it's a two-hour flight. We had a, a very enlivening, to our discussion because I was open to hearing from him and he was open to hearing from me. And we made a date that next time that I come back to Utah, to Salt Lake City, that I'll be a guest at the university, his house, we'll have lunch, and then he will come out to our temple in Salt Lake City, Hare Krishna Temple, and have a vegetarian dinner. So I... <laughs> so we... In conclusion, I said, I was trying to wrap it up, I said, the, the reason that we've enjoyed each other's association is rather than seeing the differences, we're seeing what we have in common. And the differences are superficial. At, we're at the clothes, the language that's used, etc. We have the same theme. And he said, yes, this has been very nice. And I said, can I ask you a favor? And he, he said, um, okay, what is it? I said, I would like to have a Book of Mormon, because I'd like to know more about your faith. When I meet Mormons, I can show the similarities. I, say, I said, where can I get one? He said, you can have mine. Ah. He had that book since he was a young boy, and he's elderly. He's one of the elders you know, in the church. He's a dean. And when I was looking through it, there were all kinds of notations and arrows and marks and colored, you know, you highlight in this and little notes in the back. And I said, I can't take this. This is your... This is your book. This is, you know, your, this is everything for you. He said, yes, that's why I want to give it to you. Shiddha Prabhupada Ki. So that you know that uh, this program is going to be happening on Tuesday at 6 p.m. in the evening. Um, we have arranged an initiation ceremony. The time may change based on what the Maharajas feel. Uh, and I've not known in my history in being Dallas, and you've, some of you have been here longer than I have been. Have we ever had more than one Maharaj giving initiation at the same time in Dallas? No, this is the first time. Well, we're making history. This will be the history of Dallas, and the history of Dallas, this will be the first time event of more than one Maharaj giving initiation at the same time. What he means is that I'm taking Babaji initiation. 
from Giriraj Swami. It's a sannyas and now Babaji from Giriraj Swami. That's, that's what he means. It's, you know, not that we're both, you know. <laughs> I was saying to uh, Chaitanya Chandra Prabhu today, who is a very exalted devotee in our temple, that actually in the past we've had many de devotees take initiation at the same time. And over the past few years we've just had one or two or three at a time. But this time we have eight devotees who are taking initiation and there may be more if Guru Prashad Maharaj also decides to jump in. <laughs> And uh, also, uh, I'd like to say that when uh, um, His Holiness Indra Swami Maharaj comes here, we're very fortunate to have his latest writings, and of course the writings that he did before, of his traveling all around uh, uh, the, uh, the world, uh, preaching God consciousness, Krishna consciousness, uh, the chanting of the holy names. And so those books are also available, and uh, these are the books he's holding up, these are the later the books that you've not seen, these are the new editions. Of course, he has some of the older books with him as well, here. Are they here? No, just the new ones are here. So those books are outside, and Maharaj would be very happy to sign, personally autograph your copy uh, when you take one, when you buy one. Uh, so please take advantage of that uh, program as well. So I think uh, it's now uh, three minutes to eight, uh, Maharaj's... Uh, do you think that we can wind up the program here and move on to the rest of the program? Okay, one more question. Very good. All right, Chaitanya Chandra Prabhu, you have a question? You don't have a question. <laughs> okay, somebody has a question here. Somebody who's here with us. I thought uh, what I could do is maybe read a, di a chapter, a new chapter of the absolutely, diary. So you absolutely, absolutely. You can do what that. It's like. Absolutely. I just wrote it. Absolutely. Go ahead, Marit. Thank you. Very well. It's a principle of Vaishnav etiquette that you're not supposed to um, push yourself forward. But actually, this, the diary is not about me. It's about Lord Chaitanya and Srila Prabhupada's instruction to preach all over the world. And in going to many countries in the world and spreading Krishna consciousness, it's like a great adventure. I meet so many interesting people, as I noted just during these talks. And I come into many interesting situations. And I like to like to write it down and share it with others because um, it, I always feel it's historical how um, Prabhupada's message and Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement spreading around the world. So that's, it's called Diary of a Traveling Monk and it's just my, who I meet and the engagement and where I go and so forth. So um, I'd just like to give you a little idea of what it's like for those of you who don't know. This is volume 10 and I just started on volume 11 a, a couple of weeks ago. This is uh, Volume 11, Chapter 2. It'll give you a little idea of what, what the book is like. This is a Diary of a Traveling Monk, Volume 11, Chapter 2, February 14th to the 23rd, 2010. It's called Lessons on the Road. As my flight to Los Angeles took off, I glanced through the window of the quickly fading Australian landscape and reminisced on my three-month visit to the country. Our festival tour was intense, I thought, but it went by in a flash. When you enjoy what you're doing, time passes very quickly. Exhausted, I forced myself to stay awake as a stewardess demonstrated the safety procedures. When she finished, I drifted off to sleep for offering a prayer to my spiritual master. Shri Prabhupada, please accept the results of our service. Our troop of 30 devotees presented 48 festivals, practically without a break. 27,000 people attended the two-hour cultural programs that we did over the last several months. We sold 3,500 books and 21,000 plates of prasadam. When I arrived in Los Angeles 15 hours later, I gathered my hand luggage and proceeded towards passport control and customs. The distinctly different environment of America soon made our Australian tour seem something from the distant past. Groggy from the long flight, I handed my passport to the immigration officer. Where are you coming from, he asked. I had to think for a moment. Um, Sydney. I said a little uncertainly. Don't worry, he said with a smile. Long-haul flights affect everyone. Slinging my hand luggage over my shoulder, I walked towards the baggage carousel. This tour of the U.S. will not be easy, I thought. This year I'll be doing it solo, without help. But not to complain, it's the duty of a sannyasi to travel alone and learn to depend upon Krishna. I remembered a favorite purport of Sridhar Prabhupada that's been close to my heart, since embracing the renounced order of life, 
31 years ago. Quote, it is the duty of a mendicant to experience all varieties of God's creation by traveling alone through all forests, hills, towns, villages, etc., to gain faith in God and strength of mind, as well as to enlighten the inhabitants with the message of God. A sannyasi is duty-bound to take all these risks without fear, and the most typical sannyasi of the present age is Lord Chaitanya, who traveled in the same manner through the central Indian jungles, enlightening even the tigers, bears, snakes, deer, elephants, and many other jungle animals. Shiman Bhagavatam Purport. In San Diego, three days later, and barely recovered from jet lag, I boarded another flight for Vancouver with a transit in Seattle. I was going to attend the wedding of my disciple, Sudevi Sundari Dasi, and her fiancé, Trikala Gagya Das. Typically, sannyasis don't attend weddings, but as Sudevi's spiritual master, I wanted to encourage her in the Grihastra Ashram. Being good devotees, I knew that she and her husband would work well together spreading Krishna consciousness. As I approached the check-in counter, I had a momentary lapse of memory and had to think exactly where I was going. No doubt it was due to being very tired. As I handed my ticket to the lady behind the counter, I asked her to check my bags to Seattle from where I'd be transiting to Vancouver. I have a two-hour layover, I said. I'll give the bags to a friend. I'll just be in Vancouver for the day, and I'll get a ride back to Seattle in the evening. Almost immediately, I realized I'd made a serious mistake. Some time back, it was a terrorist tactic to have a bag of explosives offloaded from a flight through one city while continuing to another. What did you say? She said suspiciously. Well, you know, I was thinking to have my, dra- my bags dropped off in Seattle, but now I realize, before I could finish the sentence, she picked up the phone and called a security officer. <laughs> Seconds later, he appeared and asked me to follow him. People stared at me as we walked away. Minutes later, I was seated in a room as he studied my passport. Leafing through it, he said, you have a lot of visas to Muslim countries. <laughs> Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Bahrain, Oman, to name a few. What business do you have in those countries, sir? Realizing the situation was getting serious, I replied, I'm a missionary, officer. I travel all over the world. What sort of missionary are you? He pressed me. I'm from the Hare Krishna movement, I replied. That's Hindu? He asked. Well, yes, I said. A Hindu missionary in Muslim countries, he challenged. I know it sounds odd, I started to say. Looking me straight in the eye, he asked, if you're on an international flight, why check your bags to a city you're transiting through? I told him the reason, but he wasn't convinced. Two minutes later, a call came through. They had checked my bags for explosives and found nothing. You can go, he said coldly. Slightly shaken, embarrassed by my foolishness, I walked back to the counter and finished checking in. As the flight to Vancouver took off, I reflected on the incident. That was a stupid mistake, I said to myself, and being tired is no excuse. Because of the delay checking in, I'd been given a seat in the middle of a row of three seats. A few minutes into the flight, the gentleman on my left said, Isn't it great how America is doing in the Olympic Games in Vancouver? I was aware the games were taking place in Vancouver, but knew nothing of the results. Uh, Yeah, just wonderful, I said. (laughs) What do you think of the performance of Bodie Miller? Asked the man on my right. Bodie Miller, I said. (laughs) They gave me the most incredulous looks. Yeah, Bodie Miller, the man on my left said. The skier, Bodie Miller. As I hesitated, the man on my right said, Are you American? Well, yes, I am, I replied. And you don't know Bodie Miller? I was silent. And what about Sean White, he continued? America's best bet for a gold in the half pipe. The half pipe, I said. (laughs) Again, they stared at me in disbelief. And what about Lindsey Vaughn, said the man on my left. She injured her shin recently, but she's still going to ski. You know her, right? Can't say that I do. I replied a little sheepishly. Man, what planet are you from, he said. (laughs) I didn't reply. If you're American, you better get your act together, he continued. America's going to kick butt up there in Vancouver. We're going to cream those commies from Russia. (laughs) Commies from Russia, I said. Russia's been a democracy for years. Why do you call them communists? Well, whatever they are, 
They ain't American, and we're going to pulverize them, he said. <laughs> yeah, along with those Chinese wimps, said the other man. That's not the spirit of the Olympics, I protested out loud. Thinking for a moment, I continued, do you guys travel much? I mean, have you ever been out of the United States? Nope, said the man on my left. This is my first trip. Me too, said the other man. I am going to the Olympics. Well, if you traveled more widely, you'd see that people are pretty much the same everywhere. We're all spirit souls struggling in this material world. They looked at me blankly and fell silent. <laughs> as I settled back in my seat, I thought, as difficult as it is to be a traveling monk, it has its advantages, one of which is seeing the true equality of all living beings. Drifting off to sleep, I remembered the words of Mark Twain, a seasoned traveler in the 19th century and one of America's best-known writers. Quote, Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all of one's lifetime. Unquote. Transiting in Seattle, I caught my connecting flight to Vancouver. Upon landing, I grabbed my hand luggage and raced to immigration. The wedding was scheduled to start in 90 minutes. Approaching the counter, I handed my passport to an immigration officer. He typed my name and passport information into his computer, paused, and then looked up. Please step to the side for a moment, he said. Is something wrong? I responded. He didn't reply. One minute went by, and another immigration officer arrived and said, Follow me, sir. As we walked away, people were staring at me, as they'd done in San Diego. Two minutes later, I was sitting in an office, this time in front of three immigration officers. I sensed the officials in San Diego had contacted them. Why have you come to Canada, the first officer said. I'm here to attend a wedding, I said. I'll be leaving for Seattle soon afterwards. What are the names of the betrothed, he asked. I froze. <laughs> I couldn't give their spiritual names, and I didn't have a clue what their legal names were. I'm sorry, officer, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know, he said? I said, yes, I only know their baptized names. He shook his head. What is the address where the wedding will take place, he asked. Again, I hesitated. I had no idea of the address. I'm not sure, I replied. I'll look it up on my iPhone. I see you spent a lot of time in Russia, he said, studying my passport closely. Uh, yes, officer, I replied a little nervously. Why? I'm a traveling monk in the Hare Krishna movement, I said. I was in Russia before the fall of communism, and I've been helping to take care of our congregation ever since. Have you ever worked for the U.S. government, he asked. No, sir, I replied. Have you ever, been, have you ever served in the armed forces, he asked. Well, yes, I did. I said, surprised by the question, I was in the Marine Corps. But what does that have to do with anything? I've come here to do a wedding, and I'm leaving tonight. He leaned forward and shot back. And you don't know the names of the couple or the address of the wedding? Well, you see, usually I get picked up and driven, I started to say. Send him back, the officer said to another official. What, I said? You're going to send me back to San Diego? A third official took my arm firmly and started leading me to the door. I suddenly had an idea. Turning around, I said, wait a minute, officer. Let me give you a number you can call. It's my secretary. She can vouch for me. She's at the wedding. My disciple, Rasika Siramani Dasi, who arranges my tours in the U.S., had driven to Vancouver with several other devotees from Seattle to attend the function. I took the number and called Rasika, grilling her for more than 15 minutes. All right, he said after hanging up. Looks like you are going to officiate at that wedding. Taking his pen, he looked at me before signing a report on the desk in front of him. Is there anything else you're planning to do while here, he said. Just to clinch it, I replied, if there's time, I might catch some of the Olympics. I mean, Bodie Miller, Lindsey Vaughn. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean White are all favors for gold medals, right? Two minutes later, I walked out of the terminal. A devotee came running up to me and greeted me. What happened, Maharaj? Did you lose your luggage? You're so late. No, I didn't lose my luggage, I replied. I just made a stupid mistake. It happens sometimes, but I learned a lesson. 
a good lesson on the road. Then I finish with a quote. Don't tell me how educated you are. Tell me how much you've traveled. Mohammed. Hare Krishna. <laughs>